Hi there! I look like shit today, I know, but honestly, I feel much more like shit because you idiots made me read more Throne of Glass, and as bad as it was last time, it got a lot worse this time. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. Okay, so a couple of things before I really get started. Uh, one, this was originally going to be the whole rest of the series. Like, I was originally hoping to do it in two parts, but I'm probably going to have to split it into three. And the reasons for that are because, one, these next two books, which are Queen of Shadows and Empire of Storms, you can see them, they're not short, okay? This, this is about 650 pages, and this one's pushing 700. Like, they're long-ass books, so I wouldn't have been able to get anything out for, like, another month if I had to stop and read the next two. And also, I kind of wanted to make parts two and three shorter than part one, because that was an hour long, and, well, some people just don't like to watch that sort of thing, so I was hoping, okay, let's make this, like, 30 minutes, or 40 maybe, and that was going well at first with Queen of Shadows, but once I got into Empire of Storms, that was a lot worse, and I have a few more things to say about it. So, basically, for part one, I had about four pages of notes to talk about, and that wound up being an hour. This one, I also have four pages of notes, so, um, I'll try to make it a little bit shorter, but, you know, we'll see how that goes. And finally, I have learned a couple other things about the series and the way it was originally supposed to be, which I'll talk about a little bit as we go on. And I do know that I was mispronouncing some of the words last time, which I apologize for and I'll fix it this time, but, you know, in my defense there was no pronunciation guide, so... You know. Uh, anyways, like I was saying, people were upset that I wasn't all that angry at the last three books. Well. These got a hell of a lot worse, so let's just stop waiting around, let's go. So, if you remember, last time, the last book ended with Selena uh, essentially just acknowledging to herself that, yep, I'm the Fey Queen, I'm the Heir of Fire, whatever. Uh, she got Rowan to swear a blood oath to her, now he serves her. Uh, the other guys found out how the King of Otterlin got rid of magic, and Dorian got captured and got a collar put on him, so now he's possessed by a demon. Uh, Adian got arrested, and Manon, the witch, which I was calling her Manon last time, sorry, but uh, Manon just kinda did things and did training stuff. There, there wasn't much of a climax to her story arc. So Queen of Shadows immediately starts off with letting us know that Dorian is still alive, that the Dorian inside his head is not controlling the body, his demon is controlling his body, but he's still alive, and that immediately robs any tension that we might have had later in the story, because later on they're talking about, like, no, we have to kill him. Well, he might be alive in there, we should try, and they're like, no, we have to kill him, that's stupid. That immediately robs all the tension, so... Cool. And then it immediately cuts to Selena in the vaults, because she's looking for her old assassin master, because she realized that an old necklace that she used to have was actually a word key, and they need it to get rid of all the demons and shit, and he still has it. But Selena is also Aelin now. And, okay, here's the thing. I, I get that Aelin is her real name. Like, I understand that Selena was something she changed it to, it was a pseudonym, whatever you want to say about it. I understand that. And I understand that she has more accepted her identity as Aelin, as the Queen, but, here's the thing, the narration calls her Aelin too. Alright, so, after three books of getting used to her being Selena, now it's Aelin, and so it just feels really awkward uh, in the narration at first. And, granted, after like, 100 pages, 150 pages, I got used to it, but the fact that there has to be that transition just feels weird and kind of stupid, and I feel like it would have been much better if they just continued calling her Selena, and, like, her public name was Aelin, but all of her friends and everything just kept calling her Selena, because that's what they knew her as, whatever. God, I'm already doing this much, and I'm only, like, ten pages in. So, she's in this, like, underground den of, like, vice and criminals and stuff to meet her old assassin master, and honestly, it's just... Like, I get that it's supposed to be dark, but it's just... it just comes across as feeling more edgy than dark, and so I can't take it seriously. Like, listen to this short excerpt. 
She flipped her gaze in the direction turn indicated. Both sides of the vaults were lined with alcoves, teeming with whores, barely curtained off from the crowds. She skipped over the writhing bodies, over the gaunt-faced, hollow-eyed women waiting to earn their keep in this festering shithole, over the people who monitored the proceedings from the nearest tables, guards and voyeurs and fleshmongers. But there, tucked into a wall adjacent to the alcoves, were several wooden booths. Like, see what I mean? It just feels a little... I don't know, it's too much. And that's only one paragraph. You get a few little excerpts like that throughout the description of the vaults. And that kind of ties into an issue I have with this book as a whole, and that is sometimes the environment's description is good, but other times it just goes way over the top with it, and it makes every single uh, environment that they're in be like the coolest, most over-the-top thing ever, or the darkest, most terrifying, most evil thing ever. And so when you get to much more dramatic moments, or moments that are supposed to be more dramatic, it doesn't really have anywhere to go, and so it, you just get this flat uh, line of emotions rather than ups and downs. God, I know I said I wanted this one to be shorter, so I'm gonna try not getting into that much detail about little things like that, but just trust me, there's a lot of shit like that going on. So, Aelin, which remember is Selena, uh, meets up with Arabin, her master, and he kind of knows everything about her now. Like, he knows, oh, you're the fire witch lady. You want your necklace. Uh, he doesn't know that it is a uh, word key, so he doesn't know it has power, and she wants to prevent him from finding out about it. Uh, but she does tell him that she wants it because it's an heirloom and has sentimental value, yada yada. Okay, that all makes sense. And he says that... He wants her to help him capture a Volg, which is a demon-possessed person that the king is using as soldiers. He wants her to help him capture one of those, and if she does that, then he'll give her her amulet. Okay, that's fine. Uh, what's a little bit less fine is that he makes it clear that he really wants to have sex with Aelin. Like, he calls her beautiful and kind of touches her a little bit inappropriately and just makes advances on her. Which would be weird enough as is, and maybe wouldn't be enough to really comment on, because, you know, he is the villain, so this is portrayed as a bad thing. But at the same time, like, he raised her, basically, from the time she was eight years old until now, when she's about 18 or 19, and I... So, so at this point, Arabin is a groomer, which is... It's more creepy than... And not, like evil villain creepy. It just feels a little off-putting and a little gross, so cool, whatever. Oh yeah, and while they're down there, Aelin also sees Kale, which remember is that old captain of the guard who she was in love with for a while but now she hates him, because... cool. Um, and anyways, she agrees to Arabin's terms, and there's a fight down in the vaults, and she runs off, and she doesn't have magic anymore because she's back on this old continent, uh, which means that the training montage that took up the majority of the last book was kind of pointless, but alright. So Aelin finds some rebels that are in the city, and Kale is among them, and she makes it clear that, like, yeah, I hate this guy now, grr, both in her inner monologue and in their conversations. And their kind of argument about it goes on way longer than it needs to. And anyways, they agree to work together at the end, and he gives her an address in the slums, which, um, it's not a huge deal, but the fact that slums in this world apparently have addresses is weird to me. So they talk a little bit more there at the hideout, and Kale kind of lets it slip to Aelin that he knows how to bring magic back, and she asks him how, but he refuses to tell her because, one, he doesn't trust her all of a sudden, and two, he hates magic now. Um... Okay. Which, I mean, I know that she hid her identity from him, so he might distrust her for that reason, but at the same time, like, if she revealed her real identity, she would have been executed, so it 
Like, is he really going to hold that against her? Okay. And the fact that he hates magic now makes no goddamn sense, because he basically says, like, well, if we go back to the way we were ten years ago, then we're going to be at the mercy of magic users. We're going to be at the mercy of shapeshifters and fey and shit. And that really doesn't make sense, because, one, magic is already still there. It's just, it's monopolized by King Otterlin, or the King of Otterlin, and all of his demon forces. So freeing it is really only going to help you, okay? That's not going to hurt you in any way. And two, they never ever mentioned, like, magic users being, like, an oppressive upper class or anything before this, so... I don't know, that seems stupid. And also, it's only been ten years since magic was gone, okay? It's not like society is completely restructured or anything, it's just... It's just... It's just a dumb arguments that they have that the author threw in there in order to stretch out the story and try and add some small level of conflict in the beginning and middle parts of the book because not much happens there. But anyways, while they're arguing, uh, they basically make a plan to save Adian, who, remember, is Aelin's cousin who was captured at the end of the last book, and to save Prince Dorian, who, like I said, has the collar on him. And Okay, fine. At, at least shit's getting moving now. So then the story shifts over to Manon for a little while, and it's just her hanging out with witches, uh, preparing the army to go out and do shit, but never actually going out and doing shit, and she kind of does nothing, and she's really annoyed because uh, one of the King of Otterland's lackeys is there, his name is Duke Parrington, and he's kind of in charge of things, and she hates that she has to do what a human says, all right, whatever. Uh, the only interesting bit from this whole thing is the revelation that witches are part demon. Like, apparently their race was created when the demons came through and they had children with fae. So they're like half fae, half demon. And nowadays witches are, they're all women, but they reproduce by uh, having sex with human men occasionally. And all their children are always girls. And just... I just want you to remember all that, because not only is it actually kind of cool, it's like one of the few bits of world building that is in this that I actually like. In fact, all the bits of world building that I like are revolve around the witches, but it's just, just remember, because it becomes relevant later. And then it cuts to a new character whose name is Elid, and she was just some girl who was a noble in Terrason, and now she's basically a slave, she's being used as a servant in Morath, which is their base of operations for the witches, um, but apparently she's also part witch, which, if you remember what I just said about how the witches reproduce, makes no sense, because they reproduce with human men, but they're always witches, so... And it mentions that her mother was descended from witches, so she, even though her mother was human, she's witch blood. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. It's a huge plot hole. Which says to me, yes, this was a first draft. And I, you're probably going to hear me say that a couple more times throughout these... Just, God. I, I, the biggest thing about all this is that I just don't care. Okay, I don't care about what Manon's doing. I don't care about what Elide's doing. They're just characters who came out of nowhere and are doing their own thing completely disconnected from the main plot, which I, I mean, I don't care about it because these books are terrible, but that's what you're supposed to care about as the reader. So Aelin, while she's hiding out in the slums, uh, gets a visit from an old, n not friend, but an old colleague, na colleague named Lysandra. And Lysandra is also sort of a worker for Arabin because thing is, he's not just an assassin master, he's also like this major crime lord, which, okay, that makes sense. Like, you know, he has his hand in assassination, smuggling, robbery, uh, prostitution, that sort of thing. And Lysandra is a prostitute who was kind of forced into it, and they make it clear throughout this that she has a lot of debt to pay off, that's the only reason she's doing it, and it's kind of traumatizing for her, and honestly, I'm making it sound more interesting than it is. It's, it's not that interesting. But basically... While they're talking, Lysandra basically just comes up to Aelin and t warns her about, Erebin is bad, okay? He's, like, evil, and he you shouldn't trust him, which is stupid, because not only did Aelin already know that, but the audience already knew that. 
Like, I, I get the feeling they just couldn't think of a better way to introduce Lysandra's character. Uh, but anyways, they argue for a bit, and they... They make it clear that they just didn't like each other uh, before a Aelin got captured and sent to the mines for a year. Like, they make it clear even before then they didn't like each other that much, but they kind of sort of become friends at this point, and they, f they become allies, let's say, and they just... They, they get a little bit more of an understanding for each other, which might have had more impact if it didn't happen all over the course of, like, 30 pages, but whatever. This book just keeps adding more and more stuff. It's just... it really doesn't need to be here. So, Aelin makes a plan to save Adian, and what that plan consists of is that apparently the king is going to bring Aiden out to... or Adian out to a public ballet recital. Okay, but he's all chained up and stuff. I guess he's, like, showing off how, haha, look, I caught the rebel, which is kind of stupid, but whatever. And then Aelin uh, manages to sneak her way backstage, pretends to be a dancer, does the whole routine perfectly, and also drops out a bunch of uh, glass flowers, which are filled with this powder, and then she crushes it, and it makes smoke and everything, and then in the confusion, she grabs Adian and runs off. Now, that's not, like a terrible plan or anything, like, I can see the thread of logic to it, but the thing is, as a reader, we were, as readers, we were not told about the powder beforehand, nor were we shown any sort of planning process for Aelin doing this, so we had no idea what she was doing going in, and we just get this surprise at the end, but again, we didn't know about the powder, so rather than being, oh, okay, they they use that in a clever way, it becomes, oh, okay, they use this new thing which I've never heard of to solve their problems. Like, that is on the same level as if a character was fighting and they discovered they have a new magic power that they never had had before. Like, that's on the same level, only it's not with combat. So, while they're running off, uh, Dorian, possessed by a demon, comes after them. Aelin tries to kill him and is stopped by one of Kale's friends, and she just it gets yelled at by him, and... Okay, like I was saying before, we, the audience, know that Dorian is alive, but one, Kale thinking that he's still alive is kind of stupid, and we get the impression throughout this that Kale is, like, desperately trying to convince himself of this, even though it makes no sense because he thinks, oh, Otterlin needs a king, and we can't just let the line die off. But the thing is, Dorian has a brother, who is barely ever mentioned in the series, but he has one, so... I mean, if you're really that concerned about whatever. And honestly, like, just Aelin's idea where, like, no, he's a very dangerous threat to us now, we have to kill him, makes way more sense than his. And it, it's just forced contrived conflict to pad out the running time. That's all it is. So Arabin tries to convince her to help him capture a Volg, and she kills it instead, and he's upset, and that's... That's it. I probably didn't even need to mention that, but whatever, it happened. So Aelin, while she's spying on the demons, goes after a Volg and tracks it into the sewers, and she f sees that one of the gargoyles which from the glass castle is alive, and it's moving around, and she's like, oh, okay, it's a demon. But, thing is, she gives it a name, sort of, just, li just listen. Report, the thing hissed through a mouth of dark stone teeth. Word hound, that's what she would call it, even if it didn't look remotely like a dog. She had the feeling the gargoyle thing could track and hunt as well as any canine, and obeyed its master well. And, here's the thing, how did she get that information? Okay, it's, it, like, it'd be one thing if she was like, oh, I read in a story about these things once, and so I know this little bit of information about them, I know what they're called. But she just, like, gives it a name for really no reason. Word Hound, which, okay, cool, that's fine. I personally would have just called it Gargoyle, but whatever, that's fine. And then they keep that name throughout the rest of the books, and she also turns out to be right about it tracking and scenting and everything. It's like, just... It's so fucking clumsy. Like, it's so amateurish. It's just... Ugh, whatever.
So she hangs out with Adian at their hideout for a while, and I wouldn't bring this up except that Adian, every time, like, his thoughts are going towards Aelin, he's thinking about how pretty she is, like, it's describing her as being beautiful, it's like describing her hair as beautiful, describing her face as beautiful, all that, and I wouldn't think twice about it except that he's her cousin, so that's a little weird. So then they're hanging around, and it turns out Rowan is back, the fae that swore a blood oath to Aelin. Like, she left him behind because she didn't think he'd be able to function properly without magic. Well, he came after her anyways, and um, she really wants to fuck him. Um, because she loves every man that she comes into contact with. Because think about it. Uh, before this series even starts, and she mentions this a couple of times, she had a guy named Sam who she was in love with, and then Dorian she was in love with for the first book, and then it immediately went over to Kale, and now it's at Rowan. And so she just loves every man she comes into contact with. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. Real people, uh, you do sometimes like fall in and out of love with people in real life. I get that. Uh, but the problem is... As a reader, as the audience, we don't get, like, we just don't connect to it that much if it keeps happening. Because it happened with Dorian, and it didn't have that much impact. So then it happens with Kale, and it has a little bit less impact. And then Rowan has less impact, because it's just happening over and over and over again with the same character. So it just, it's, it just really shoots the romance subplot in the foot when you do that. Oh god, I've been filming for over 25 minutes already, shit. So, Lysandra is talking to them a little bit, and she reveals that she's a shifter, but, you know, she couldn't use magic anymore. She's basically an animorph. You know, she can turn into animals, turn into other people, she can just change her appearance at will. Cool, whatever. Uh, then they catch a demon with no trouble, and they make to bring it to Arabin, but, you know, they, they really have no trouble with it, is the thing. Like, this is supposed to be a really powerful soldier, you know, that it is way stronger than most humans, and they just catch it without any trouble. That's the thing. Like, it, if it had been difficult, if they had had to plan a little bit, if it had been hard for them, that would have been one thing, but, like, it, it just makes the demons seem less dangerous and less intimidating than this book is obviously trying to make them. And also, throughout a lot of this, Rowan and Aelin have, like, telepathy, basically. Like, basically, they will look at each other's expressions, and then the narration will have this whole thing of, like, what they're thinking, and Aelin looked at Rowan's expression, and then it was as though he was saying with his eyes, blah blah blah. And, now, that's actually pretty common, in books, like, don't get me wrong, that's fine if you do it once, but the fact is that they do it, Rowan will say one thing, will say one thing, and then Aelin will say something back, and then he'll say something back, like, do you people have fucking telepathy? My god, this is just stupid. And it does that a lot in this book, <clears throat> doesn't really do it in the next one, I don't think, but it's just, god, there's so many little things that make this book even worse than the first three, because the first three were bad, don't get me wrong, but this one, not only do they add a bunch of unnecessary shit to pad it out and make it long as hell, but they just keep adding little things like that that are super fucking dumb. And don't worry, we'll find big things that are dumb too later on, but Jesus Christ. So basically, they bring the demon over to Arabin, but they cut off the ring that was keeping the demon in the guy's body, so he is a human again, and they give Arabin a fake ring, uh, cool, and then he tries to use it to enslave Aelin, and she pretends that it's working, um, and he makes her say I love you, because, you know, he's a groomer, and it's creepy, but not in a good way, and anyways, then he has sex with Lysandra, and while he's sleeping, Lysandra kills him. It's very anticlimactic, because, like, they've spent this whole book so far, uh, and this is about two-thirds of the way through, I think. They, they spend this whole book uh, building up Arabin as not only this mastermind, but also this crazy badass. And they have to go 
and do this whole elaborate plan to kill him, but it turns out in the end, the plan is just, yeah, we're gonna have someone stab him while he's asleep, like, whatever. So, anyways, um, they read off Arabin's will not long after that, and it says that he left everything to Aelin, which is a huge surprise. And it turns out that off-screen, Aelin snuck into the vault where his will was kept and replaced it with a forgery, which left everything to her, and then she destroyed all the copies of the original. But again, this happened off-screen with no build-up or anything, and we didn't know anything about it. And it's just, like, that could have been a fun part of the story, is the thing. That could have been, like, a miniature heist subplot that they have to go through, and then when we get to the will, we see their plan pay off, and it's, like, a satisfying moment. But the thing is that, one, this is already way too long, so that would probably involve cutting out some of the romance shit, and two, uh, this author seems way more preoccupied with surprising us than she is with actually making a story that fits together and is structured properly. So anyways, uh, Lysandra still has debt, and apparently her debt gets jacked up because the person she owes debt to was expecting money from Arabin and made purchases, and now she owes money, and it, like, I don't think that's how debt works, but whatever. And the thing is, Aelin owns, like, basically a country's treasury worth of money now, why not just pay off Lysandra's debt? Like, I, I feel like you could just do that, because they're talking about it, and Lysandra's like, yeah, my debt's higher now, but it was worth it to see the look on her face when they like, why not just pay it off? And, like, she does pay it off later on in the book, but seriously, why not just... What? So then Manon is hanging out in Morath still, and, um, you might remember from the first book there was this character named Coltane, and she was actually in the second one as well, but, uh, I just didn't mention her because it... Does, she doesn't do much there, and she was just this noble lady that hated Selena and then got arrested, and then she got a demon put in her, she has the collar and everything, and she apparently can use this thing called Hellfire, which is just black fire, which doesn't burn, whatever. Uh, it's not that important, but I mentioned it, so yeah, here we are. And then Rowan and Aelin are still hanging out, and Rowan is kind of just whining about her being mean because we need some sort of conflict, like I said. It's just... God, this is just draining to even remember. And while the Hellfire stuff is going on, um, basically they start doing some experiments with the witches that Manon is kind of upset about, but she still allows to go through with. And basically they want to implant Volg babies into the witches so that they'll give birth to, like, demons. Um, okay, that, that makes sense and all. It seems a little weird that Manon would put up with it, but whatever. Uh, and then another fae, who, if you remember, Rowan was a servant of Maeve, who was the fae queen, and she had, like, a little cadre of personal guards who were all blood-sworn to her, and basically another one named Ro- or not Rowan, uh, Lorcan comes and finds them, and he wants uh, the word keys, basically, because uh, Maeve is looking for them, and he thinks that if Maeve gets them, then the power is going to kill her. So basically, he wants to find them and destroy them, so she never does, uh, because he, you know, is still somewhat loyal to her, and he thinks he's doing the best thing for her. Um, okay, fine. So him and Rowan agree to swap uh, the amulet's word key for this ring that he has, which is supposed to make the wearer immune to being possessed by Volg. Cool. And Rowan trades him for it, but it's actually a fake amulet, so they still have it. So Lysandra gets captured and kidnapped by the King of Otterland's forces because I guess they found out she was a magic user and he wants her or something. Uh, but then they take her off into like this forest where they meet up with the witches, and this is the first time that Manon actually runs into the main cast of characters, so, you know, I'm glad we're finally tying that fucking plot thread in here, but we didn't need to spend all the hundreds of pages on it that we did. Uh, but anyways, they go to rescue Lysandra, they do it, and then as they're running, Aelin fights Manon, and even without her magic, she still manages to not immediately die, so I'm like, Again, this character is, like, really OP, 
stupidly overpowered, but whatever. And, um, Manon winds up getting trapped but, and about to die in a collapsing temple, and Aelin saves her for no reason, really. So Manon is going around with her witches, thinking about stuff, and one of her witches just tells her a story about how she got pregnant like 70 years ago, because remember, they're all like 100 years old at this point, and she gave birth to a stillborn, which is apparently a big failure in witch culture, so she got uh, ostracized, kind of, and severely punished by Manon's grandmother, and Manon's like, man, my grandmother is like evil as shit, which, yeah, every time we see her grandmother in this, she's like just over the top evil and over the top cruel and over the top just violent to her subordinates, to the point where I'm really just wondering why the fuck they follow her at all? Why, they, why do they do what she says? But, you know, whatever. I guess this is Manon just learning to be empathetic or something. I don't care. Oh yeah, and I should mention that while this is happening, Manon uh, speaks to Dorian, possessed by a demon a little bit, and the demon inside of him is freaking out because she has golden eyes, and that's like the sign of the Vald Kings. Uh, but Manon also realizes that Dorian is still alive in there, the demon isn't just all that's there, which, again, might have had some sort of impact if we, the audience, didn't already know that. So, we cut back to Kale a little bit, and him hanging out with one of his rebel friends, and she's, like, his girlfriend now, because we needed another fucking love triangle. You know, we started off with Aelin, Dorian, and Kale, and then Dorian left, so that died off. Uh, and then Rowan got added in there, so we had another one, but then her and Kale kind of broke up, and now Kale has another girlfriend, so we have, like, four overlapping love triangles, and this one's being brought back from the dead, and it just... Just... Who... Who fucking thought this was a good idea? So Manon leaves a message letting them know that Dorian is alive. Cool. And then Aelin finally finally, finally, infiltrates the castle, but there's still a hundred pages left, so I just, um, just, okay, cool, whatever. So, basically, Aelin starts fighting the king and Dorian, uh, while all her friends are kind of, like, down in sewers and stuff, fighting demons and demon soldiers. All right, that's kind of cool. Um, and then... Aelin gets uh, stabbed by Dorian, but she manages to slip the ring that she got from Lorcan on him, which makes you immune to the Vald, and it sort of short-circuits the demon and cracks the collar, so Dorian comes back. And then uh, they manage to blow up the tower, which... Oh yeah, I forgot to mention earlier, they find this big um, source of this thing called Hellfire, well, it's basically just dragon fire from Game of Thrones. Like, you know, it's stuff that you burn and it sort of explodes and, like, okay, whatever. Like, they, they find it and we weren't really told that it existed beforehand, but, you know, whatever. They put it around the clock tower in order to blow it up. And they also, while they were down there, they found the tomb of King Gavin, who was another king of Otterlin, who threw out the demons, like, a thousand years ago. And they're like... Wait a minute, he did something bad, but we don't know what it was, and it's just... whatever. And anyways, they blow up the tower. So now magic is back, and Dorian and Elena... or Aelin, excuse me, fights the king, and they manage to defeat him. But... But, 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 but... Here's the thing. Before he actually dies, the king sort of softens up, has a total personality shift, and he starts acting nice again. He's like, oh, Dorian, you're alive. And they're like, wait, what's going on here? And he's like, oh, I was possessed by a demon the whole time. Okay. So him and Duke Parrington, remember, this is the guy with the witches hanging out there, they apparently just found some demons, um that were locked away and accidentally freed them, and they got possessed. And Parrington is actually the boss, because he's possessed by the king of the demons. And so, the king, the king, the king, the king, 
he was just doing all of this stuff, not because he was evil, but because he's possessed. And they just revealed this at the end, because we're in a JRPG now. He's a JRPG villain now. And, okay, he didn't have any personality before. He was just evil dude. But at least he was an evil dude who was just evil, you know? He didn't really have an excuse for it, and now he has a kind of excuse for all the shit he did, and you don't have to hate him or feel bad for him, because now we're shifting villains, and now the demons are the real villains, as opposed to the king being the real villain who's just using the demons to do his bidding. Okay, that's all stupid enough as is, but apparently what happened is that the king knew that the demons were going to make him hunt down magic users and turn them into soldiers and all that, so in order to try and protect them, he took over for a little bit, and he was the one that ordered all the towers built to uh, suppress magic. And not only was he able to do that uh, without the demons finding out about it, but he was able... the demons didn't find out why he did it for, uh, for ten years. Like, they never found out why he did it. And I just... Okay, okay, that's really stupid, okay? If you're gonna use the excuse that he's possessed by a demon, that makes no sense. And plus, he completely failed anyways, because they still found magic users by looking at their genealogy. Just looking at their lineages, they were able to figure out, okay, this person had magic in their bloodline, so let's take them, and they were still able to make their soldiers. And uh, th I will give this one thing, though. It does offer an explanation for why Dorian... Uh, still was able to use magic, even with the towers around. It's apparently because uh, the king used his blood in the spell, so his uh, family would be immune from it. That that makes sense. I'll, I'll give it that little scrap of help. God, we're more than 40 minutes into this shit. God damn it. Ugh. So they uh, destroy the castle when they blow everything up, and it like, actually shatters, and Aelin just... Uh, makes fire on all the glass shards before it hits the city, so it just makes this giant wall of glass, or like a frozen tsunami of glass, which, again, is like kind of a cool image, and actually, while all this is going on, there's also, like, you know, it cuts back to other fighting with the rebels, and once Lissandra gets her uh, powers back, she is able to, like, shift into animals and stuff instantly, and she uses it to go killing people, which is kind of cool, actually. So, okay, here's the thing. It's an almost okay climax, and then, uh, at the end, Aelin just goes back to Terrasin and stuff, and they're like, oh man, we're still gonna have to fight demons and shit, well, let's be careful. And, also, um, back at Morath, Kaltane, uh, sort of breaks free of her control, but she's so angry that she's like, I'm just gonna destroy everything, and she warns Manon and some of the witches and Elid to, like, run away, but she also cuts open her arm and gives a stone to Elid. And Elite doesn't know what it is, but it's pretty clearly a word key. Uh, cool. And she's like, just be be careful, take this to Selena, because I owe her. And then she blows up Morath and kills most of the people there. Okay. Here's the thing. Uh, even if we ignore everything else about this, this was pretty clearly, obviously, meant to be a trilogy to begin with. Because this is book four. Book one, I actually described as feeling like it was a prologue, and then books two, three, and four are very obviously a trilogy. Because the first one is Selena just working for the king, not really liking it, and then at the end, uh, she just finally commits to, okay, yeah, I'm gonna fight against this dude, and we find out about her real identity. And then the second one is, like, the dip in the trilogy, where it's mostly just preparing for the real final battle and finding out some more vital information and just getting stronger, training, etc. And then this third one, this is pretty clearly the climax to the original story. And I don't know if I mentioned, but this was originally supposed to be a trilogy. So it's very easy to tell because, like, they beat the bad guy, they bring magic back, they free all the kingdoms that were under the bad guy's control. Yeah, that's... That's, that's pretty clearly the end, but it also goes, oh no, the real Puppet Master was this guy, so they can stretch it out more. So, the thing is, if this... If, if the book had ended here, like, if it had ended at book four, and they, you know, they cut out the stuff about the demons being in charge and all that, 
then it would have been bad. Okay, it would have been a bad series, but it wouldn't really have been noteworthy bad. It would have just been like, yeah, bad young adult fantasy. If they had uh, cut out the first book and rearranged some stuff so that it was a proper trilogy and they cut out uh, some of the unnecessary bits, it would just be your average, well, below average young adult fantasy. It really wouldn't be anything to write home about. But the fact that it goes on this long and that it's this obviously stretched out just for the sake of money and for the sake of making more shit, that's w where it really starts to fall. And now that I'm going to get into book five, Empire of Storms, just, um, well, you'll, you'll see what I mean. So I will say that even though I have an actual physical copy of it here, uh, I didn't actually read this one. I listened to the audiobook because the thing is, like, I was just, I read like 40 pages of it and I was just so done. I could not take it anymore. So I got the audiobook. And that one was pretty long. It was about 25 hours, but I was able to get through it while taking care of other business. So it was a little bit easier to get through for the most part. So I guess if for whatever reason you still want to read these books, I guess just audiobooks. So this one starts off with a flashback with uh, Queen Elena, who if you remember Selena back when she was Selena, met her in the catacombs of the Glass Castle, and she kind of helped her out because she was a ghost. Uh, and King Gavin, who I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, it's them fighting the demons, and it's really a retcon because, you know, we, we had heard that they banished the demons and they banished the king, but uh, in this they mentioned like, oh, okay, we can't actually kill the king, so we're just going to lock him away for a little while. And it's just, it's just a retcon. That, that's all it is. And then once we get into modern day, it starts off with Elid in the woods, and she meets the Fae Lorcan, and they argue a bunch at first, but then they decide they're friends and they want to travel together, and they're, they're going up to Terrasin because Elid needs to bring the word key, even though she doesn't know it's a word key, to Aelin, just whatever, cool. That actually takes up a pretty significant chunk of the book, by the way, it's just them traveling together. So Aelin and company go to Terrasin, and they meet with some of the lords there, and they try to be like, hey, I'm the rightful heir to the kingdom, I need to, you, you need to recognize me as queen so that we can, you know, gather everything together, get our resources all squared up so that we can fight the demons properly. But the lords uh, d mostly just decide that they dislike them, and they're like, no, we're not going to recognize you as queen, um, which is kind of weird because this series seems to be leaning pretty hard into the divine right of kings argument, which I'm not going to really get into because I already have a whole other video about that, but basically this series, the, uh, well, all the monarchs are descended from lines that have ruled for, like, over a thousand years, and the, uh, certain bloodlines do have, like, actual magical powers, uh, that other ones don't, and certain bloodlines are immortal or partially immortal, so... Like, this seems to lean really hard into that whole divine right of kings. Like, yes, they were chosen by the gods, they are in charge of shit. So it seems weird that they would go against that, but whatever, like I said, we need conflict. So they argue a bunch, and just whatever. And then Selena, or, I'm sorry, Aelin. Like, I, see, this is what I mean, okay? The narrator, the narrator needs to stick with one name for the main character, okay? You can sometimes get away with switching names for smaller, minor characters, but this is the fucking protagonist. We spend a lot of time with her, okay? So, Aelin and her friends go off and retake a city which was part of Terrasin, but it has been occupied by Otterlin soldiers even after their king died and everything. And e even though Dorian is the king now, and I feel like he could just tell them to leave, whatever. Cool. So Dorian is back in Rifthold, being the king, and he doesn't like being the king very much. And uh, the witches, under the orders of Erewhon, who is like the king of the demons who was controlling Carrington, uh, he orders them to go there and just wreck the city. And uh, Dorian's there, and he tries fighting, but he's like, oh, it's hopeless. And Rowan shows up, and he's like, hey, we gotta get you out of here. So he takes them, and they run off. And they argue a bunch, because, you know... Everybody argues in this. Oh god, I still have a lot of notes left. The simplest way I can think to describe why this series is so bad 
is that it's a pretty simple story at the end of the day. Like, it really is. You know, it's people rebelling against evil demon king, and then it later changed into, okay, we're just fighting these evil demons. Like, it's just, the bad guys are just evil, and the good guys just need to defeat them. It's really not complicated. It's a simple story, but it's trying to become a complex story by being told in a complex way. Okay, they're trying to add uh, plot twists. They're trying to ma get, make us surprised by having Aelin do shit off screen and then have it just pop up out of nowhere. They're trying to have a whole bunch of different characters telling the story from a whole bunch of different angles, but when you look at a simple story from a bunch of different complex angles, it doesn't make it a complex story, it just makes it a simple story which is kind of confusing and hard to follow and very poorly paced. So Elid and Lorcan are traveling and they take just forever to do anything, like hundreds and hundreds of pages of them just traveling, okay? They're with a carnival and Elid really wants to fuck Lorcan and Al Lorcan really wants to fuck Elid. It's just, th that's what happens. Okay, cool. So, Aelin and company try to get pirate help from this pirate lord who just hangs out on islands and he controls his own city and everything. They're called the Dead Islands and he controls Skull's Bay, um, which is fine. And then they also mention that, like, oh, this old noble family used to run things here, but they're, they're gone. And I, I... I don't know. Whatever. It happens. And they just fucking argue about this for... Uh, forever. Like, it's just, a Aelin apparently destroyed some of his ships uh, back when she was still Selena and freed a bunch of his slaves, and he's upset about that. And um, so he doesn't like them, and he also just doesn't want to fuck with demons, which is kind of fair, honestly. And so he's just like, I'm not helping you guys, I'm doing my own thing, I'm staying away from this. And they try and convince him, and he doesn't do it, and they try and convince him, and he doesn't do it for, seriously, forever. Like... I cannot describe to you how long this takes unless you really see for yourself just how much of this book is taken up by nothing happening. Also, apparently Maeve has an armada and she's coming over the ocean to this continent. <sighs> yeah, okay, whatever. And uh, so they get some ships and they start doing stuff, but the pirate lord still doesn't want to do anything. Whatever. And uh, then a goddess takes over Aelin's body because, cool. And apparently this goddess is Diana, which is the goddess of the hunt. And, you know, I would have given this series the measliest speck of credit for having the characters actually have a couple of gods uh, that di had different domains and were actually mentioned a little bit in the story and didn't really play a huge role in the world building or anything, but... You know, at least it was there, but Diana is literally the Roman name for Artemis, who was the goddess of the hunt. So you're just taking shit from real life now, and not in a fun way. It's just, whatever. She takes over Aelin's body for a little bit, and Aelin throws her out, and then she talks to Elena, and Elena's like, oh, she's angry with you now, and also apparently, uh, e Elena kind of sort of talks about how she was supposed to banish Erewhon from their dimension, banish the demons from their dimension, by uh, sacrificing herself, but she just was unable to do it, so instead she locked him away. And, um, okay, cool. And apparently the gods are actually just beings from another world, kind of like the demons, but they're on a higher plane of existence, so humans can't really interact with them. Uh, that might be cool in a different series, but it's stupid here. And anyways, Elena basically just tells Aelin that because she's of her bloodline, she's descended from her, she's going to have to die. And, well, that, like we kind of get more information on that later on, but that is that is the basic gist of everything. I'm just giving it all right here so you know what's happening. So anyways, Skull's Bay, where the pirates are hanging out, gets attacked by some sea wyverns and by some demons. And... They actually manage to defeat them because Lysandra turns herself into a sea weavern and actually fights them, and uh, the other guys will, like, fire, you know, harpoons and stuff at them. And honestly, it's a cool battle. I'll, like, yeah, I'll give it that. This is the only part of the book where 
I was not thinking, God, get it over with, get it over with. I was actually thinking, yeah, this is, this is pretty cool. So, for whatever reason, just, yeah, I, I liked this bit. However, however, there is a but. Because it is, it, it doesn't make any sense from a story perspective. Because, think about it, this is a neutral territory, or the closest thing to a neutral territory that you can have here, which is not going to fight the demons, but then Erewhon and his demons attack it and almost destroy it, and then afterwards when they survive, they're like, okay, I guess we're fighting against Erewhon now, we don't really have a choice. So they just gave their opponents a bunch of allies by doing this. It's just... it's stupid. And then afterwards, when Lysandra is kind of beaten up and still in her sea wyvern uh, thing, Aiden, Aiden proposes to her. He actually says, hey, it might not be today or tomorrow, but I'm gonna marry you. And, uh, like, I didn't mention it, but they were sort of making eyes at each other in the last book and in this one early on. Because, just, whatever. And, uh, then Aelin and Rowan have sex. And at this point, it, this is like just, this is almost pornographic. No, this is straight up pornographic, okay? Because it, it's very, very sexually explicit, and it goes on for a while. Like, I, here's the thing. This is young adult, or at least it's marketed as young adult. So I personally think that you should be able to get away with a little bit of sex and stuff. Like, you can imply that characters had sex, or you can mention sexual acts by name, and but going into explicit detail about it, and mentioning how she put her hand down his pants and felt velvet steel down there, which, by the way, yes, she does describe his boner as being velvet steel, because this is just terribly written at the end of the day, <laughs> which is funny. But also, uh, I was listening to this whole thing while they're fucking on the beach. I was listening to it while I was at the gym uh, with my headphones, so that it was, um, you know, that was, that was fun. And just, you, you get a bunch more, like, really sexually explicit things after that, and it's just really obnoxious. So then Lorcan and Alid tell each other their secrets, like, Lorcan tells her who he really is, Alid tells him who she really is, and she shows him the stone, and it turns out, oh, it's a word key. And he, for whatever reason, he, like, loves her now, so he's like, okay, we'll get this to Aelin because demons and stuff. Seriously, 80% of the book is just one character thinking about how much they want to fuck another character. And then a lot of times they actually do fuck other characters. Like, it's, this is just porn, okay? Actually, no, scratch that. At least in porn, I believe that the characters like each other. Eureka! I was just thinking, I could offer to lick your if you'd let me copy your answers. I agree. I would love for you to lick my So, while all of this is going on, Manon, uh, back at Morath, is, you know, having more tension with her commanders uh, because of the, like, you know, imprint implanting witches with demon babies, which kills them. And she's upset about it, and she brings it up with her grandmother, and her grandmother knew about it. But she doesn't care because she thinks if Erewhon takes over, then she's gonna get the witches are gonna get their kingdom back. Um, cool. And then she Manon eventually fights her grandmother so that she can buy time for her uh, friends to escape, her thirteen as they're called to escape. And her grandmother uh, wounds her really badly. And while they're fighting, she tells her about her parents. And apparently, her mother was you know she was a black beak, iron teeth witch. But her father was also a witch of the Crocken clan, who they've been hunting down and killing Crockens for years because they're enemies. And I, apparently, even though in the last book they mentioned that all witch children were girls, apparently boys are rarely born as well. And at some point she killed her own father, which might have meant something if Manon wasn't shown to be, like, a total psycho during her character introduction. Whatever. Um, Manon manages to escape, and she lives, and her and Abraxos fly off, and they find the ship where Aelin and them are hanging out on, and, uh, she asks them for help, and they're like, well, we'll keep you alive, but we're gonna keep you prisoner as well, and Dorian sees her, and he immediately wants to fuck her, because I already explained why. 
So they start sailing somewhere else because uh, Aelin got like visions of ruins in the stone marshes from Elena. All right, cool. Um, so they start sailing, and as they're going along the coast of Aelway, it's like burning because demons are destroying shit, and they help a little bit, but they don't really have time to stop. Um, cool. So they go to the ruins, and here they finally manage to meet up with Lorcan and Elite, so they're like, oh, cool, another word key. And there's fighting with demons and stuff, and in the end they just find this magical witch mirror, uh, which they don't really know how to use it yet, but, you know, magical witch mirror. So then they're sailing, and they're sailing, and they come across the capital of another kingdom, Melisande, which was originally part of uh, Otterland's empire, and uh, they decided not to break away because they're, like, really close to Morath, and Erewhon was able to sort of, like, you know, they were right there, so they're like, okay, we're going to ally with them. And they see this big armada just lined up, and they're like, oh, fuck, there's going to be a big fight. And then Aelin's like, no, nah, don't worry about it. And she, like, literally walks up to the leader of the armada, and apparently she knows her. Now, the woman in charge is named Ansel, and apparently not only were Ansel and Aelin friends back when she was Selena the Assassin, not only that, but... Uh, after Selena got put in prison, Ansel, who, uh, it, that's another character with, whose name starts with A, by the way, it makes it things confusing, but whatever, Ansel went to Briarcliff, which is like this human settlement where the Witch Kingdom used to be, because apparently it's only wasteland when witches try to farm and stuff, for humans it's fine, which, okay, cool, but Ansel went to Briarcliff, killed the old queen, managed to take over, and then came over to Melisande and took over there as well. Okay. So this character that we have never, has never been mentioned, we've never been told about, is apparently just best friends with the protagonist and also took over these other places and also is now your ally. So all these allies just come out of nowhere and are now friends with the with the main characters, so they now have an army when they needed an army. Even Rowan is fucking confused by this. God, this was a first draft, okay? This, these were all first draft. There was no editing process for these, okay? This, th this is what happens when you're just discovery writing, you realize, oh, characters are in a corner, how do I do this? Throw something in there, but then you don't go back to try and make it make sense. This is like, the most pulling out of an ass helping the main characters I have seen possibly ever. So, you know, they continue talking for a long-ass time and being like, oh, what are we gonna do? We're talking, this stuff, whatever. And, uh, the, the... At one point, they have a brazier on a ship, which... I know I said I'd stop mentioning little things, but that's just really stood out as stupid to me. So you have this big fire on a ship which is made of wood, held together with tar, and then covered with hemp rope and canvas cloths, canvas sails. Does that, does that really, does that seem safe to you? So, also while they're talking, they mention that uh, people are, like, afraid of Aelin now because they're afraid that, like, oh, once she defeats the demons, she's all-powerful, she might go off and conquer stuff, even though she's never said anything about that, and she doesn't really show any signs of cruelty or anything, we're just, we're afraid of her because we need more conflicts. This book is pushing 700 pages, by the way. We need more. So Maeve and her Ramada are coming in close, and it looks like they're about to fight, and they're like, okay, we have an army, but our army is like army of humans, and they have immortal fey, and they're more powerful magic and all that. And so Rowan uh, sneaks around and goes to various fey who he is related to, and he tries to ask them for help because most of them don't really like Maeve anyways. Uh, which, okay, seems fair, and uh, they, they agree to maybe help him, and then later they do, so, you know. At least this, at least this time, when the Fae start helping them out, it doesn't just happen during the battle, and they're like, whoa, why are they helping us? And Rowan's like, I went around uh, before the battle doing stuff. Like, they actually set it up this time. So, Aelin and Manon uh, are talking about the magical witch mirror, and apparently there's a prophecy, which is like, iron and fire together will 
save the world, because we need to add a prophecy now. I, I really hate prophecies in stories. I just... I do. The only series I've ever read that did it okay was Percy Jackson. But, and... Oh, we're running low on memory. Shit. So, Aelin and Manon go into the mirror, uh, and there's a big, long flashback where Elena is, like, going through everything that we already kind of knew, and... I don't know. It's just really boring and uninteresting, and like I said, Aelin has to die in order to forge the lock and cast the demons out of their dimension, which makes sense because, you know, this is a fantasy story with a perfect Mary Sue main character. Obviously, she's going to die at the end to save the world. And even beyond that, it shows that Elena actually helped them out in the past, like, from, as a ghost, she, like, influenced events to help them out. Like, when she was a child and fell into the river and almost drowned, like, she was the one that sort of went into Arabin's head and convinced him to go off near the river where he found her, and... Cool, whatever. So there's a big battle with Maeve, and Lysandra is cool, actually, during it. Like, you know, like I said, she's... I don't know when she became the one likable character in this series, but, well, she did. And, uh, then Manon's 13 arrive and also help, um, but they're still uh, barely holding the line. And then Maeve comes along, and Aelin and Manon manage to leave the mirror, and they get s sort of captured by M Maeve, and Maeve is just basically just going on this long spiel about how I am evil, I am going to destroy you, I am going to rule everything because I am evil, and I will destroy the demons, and... It's basically the same problem as Manon's grandmother, where everything she does is so over-the-top evil that you wouldn't understand why anyone would follow her. Because there are, you know, blood oaths that a lot of them take, so they're kind of forced to follow her, but at the same time... Why not just avoid taking the oath? So apparently Maeve knew about the prophecy, and she also was trying to influence events to make shit happen. Cool. And apparently she killed Rowan's girlfriend way back when, and uh, she specifically set things up to make Aelin and Rowan fall in love uh, so that she could break her will? Break her spirit? I... just... whatever. She's, she's following the prophecy too, just fuck it. So she tortures Aelin a bunch, and uh, eventually she manages to get Aelin taken away from them and locks her in an iron coffin, and then both sides leave because they're too exhausted to fight anymore. So they can't let everyone know that their queen is gone, though, because she's like the symbol of resistance and all that. So they have Lysandra, who, remember Shapeshifter, uh, pretend to be her out in public, and they're going to have her and Adian pump out babies so that uh, they can have an actual monarch on the throne who's still from the proper bloodline, even though the lords really have no interest in that, apparently. Whatever. And Adian is mad about this, and Rowan and Aelin apparently got married, like, right before the battle and everything happened. Like, you should really give us this information during or before it becomes relevant. Like, just... Whatever, man. I, I don't have energy to, to complain about little shit anymore. I gotta keep going. I gotta power through. So, Wendlin, which is, remember, the kingdom across the ocean where Selena's other cousin rules, uh, arrives with an armada and a fleet, and a bunch of other soldiers and stuff also arrive who are apparently, like, they're assassins and thieves and stuff, and apparently they were old friends of Aelin back when she was an assassin, and they, like, owe her debt, debts and stuff, so they're just agreeing to come here and fight demons. Um, again, we were never told about this, it just sort of happened. Just roll with it, I guess. And, uh, Rowan is made the king in all but name of Terrison because they want him to lead the battles and everything, and just... that That's the end of Book 5, Empire of Storms. So, man, like I said, as dumb as all the stuff I brought up was, it's so, so much worse than you really understand, because 
so much of it is just people arguing being dicks to each other for no reason, and so much of it is just people, I don't, traveling, people falling in love, making eyes at each other, wanting to have sex with each other. So much of this book is just that, and when you skip over all that, you realize how vacuous a lot of the plot is. And honestly, maybe even vacuous isn't the right word, but it's just so incoherent, so not thought out, so long. It's so long, okay? Like I was saying before, these would be bad if they were shorter, but they would be tolerable, okay? And there were people that were upset that I didn't really rage at the last three, at the first three books, I should say, and well, now, yeah, I'm <laughs> genuinely really annoyed and angry that you idiots made me read this. <coughs> <coughs> so, the first three books, like I said, they were bad, but honestly, I don't think they would have cracked my top ten. With the addition of Queen of Shadows and Empire of Storms, I think this breaks the top five, okay? This, this might be worse than The Fifth Sorceress, honestly, which... If, if you know anything about the Fifth Sorceress, you you know that's saying a lot, but... Uh, fuck me. This did not wind up being short. I swear I wanted this to be uh, like a 30 or 40 minute episode, but that's not what we got, and... Well, that's, uh, you know, I'm going on to part three now. Although I will say that uh, book six where is... it takes place about simultaneously with book five, except it's about Kale and his girlfriend off having their own adventures, and even people that like this series think that that's pointless and you don't really need to read it, so I will be skipping over that, and uh, tune in for part three, which should be coming out in a couple of weeks, I don't know exactly when, but part three is Kingdom of Ash, it is the final book, and then I will be done with this series, so if you watched this far, thank you, please like the video, and comment on the video, and subscribe to my channel if you haven't, and thanks a bunch to my patrons, especially Apo Savalainen, Christ Brother Santodes, Christopher Hawkins, Christopher Quinten, Joseph Pendergraft, and of course, Tobacco Crow. You guys are cool, and please consider donating to my page if you aren't already, and I'm very tired, and my throat hurts, so I'm going to go do something else. Bye.